Chapter Five of Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by San Maestro. We had been stationed in the old cotton gin house about twenty days, had recovered from the fatigues of our journey and were greatly improved in our strength and appearance when our master returned one evening after an absence of two days and told us that we must go to columbia the next day and must for this purpose have our breakfast ready by sunrise on the following morning he called us at daylight and we made all dispatch in preparing our morning repast the last that we were to take in our present residence as our equipments consisted of a few clothes we had on our persons and a solitary blanket to each individual our baggage was easily adjusted and we were on the road before the sun was up half an hour and in less than an hour we were in columbia drawn up in a long line in the street opposite the courthouse the town which was small and mean-looking was full of people and i believe that more than a thousand gentlemen came to look at us within the course of this day we were kept in the street about an hour and were then taken into the jail yard and permitted to sit down but were not shut up in the jail the court was sitting in columbia at this time and either the circumstance or the intelligence of our arrival in the country or both had drawn together a very great crowd of people we were supplied with vegetables by the jailer and had small allowance of salt pork for dinner we slept in the jail at night and as none of us had been sold on the day of our arrival in columbia and we had not heard any of the persons who came to look at us make proposals to our master for our purchase i suppose it might be his intention to drive us still farther south before he offered us for sale but i discovered my error on the second day which was tuesday this day the crowd in town was much greater than it had been on monday and about ten o'clock our master came into the yard in company with the jailer and after looking at us some time the latter addressed us in a short speech which continued perhaps five minutes in this harangue he told us we had come to live in the finest country in the world that south carolina was the richest and best part of the united states and that he was going to sell us to the gentleman who would make us all very happy and would require us to do no hard work but only raise cotton and pick it he then ordered a handsome young lad about eighteen years of age to follow him into the street where he observed a great concourse of persons collected here the jailer made another harangue to the multitude in which he assured them that he was about to sell the most valuable lot of slaves that had ever been offered in Columbia, that we were all young, in excellent health, of good habits, having been all purchased in Virginia from the estates of tobacco planters, and that there was not one in the whole lot who had lost the use of a single finger, or was blind of an eye. He then cried the poor lad for sale, and the first bid he received was two hundred dollars. Others quickly succeeded and the boy who was a remarkably handsome youth was striking off in a few minutes to a young man who appeared not much older than himself at three hundred and fifty dollars the purchaser paid down his price to our master on a table in the jail and the lad after bidding us farewell followed his new master with tears running down his cheeks he next sold a young girl about fifteen or sixteen years old for two hundred and fifty dollars to a lady who attended the sales in her carriage and made her bids out of the window in this manner the sales were continued for about two hours and a half when they were adjourned until three o'clock in the afternoon they were again resumed and kept open until about five o'clock when they were closed for the day as my companions were sold they were taken from amongst us and we saw them no more the next morning before day i was awakened from my sleep by the sound of several heavy fires of cannon which were discharged as it seemed to me within a few yards of the place where i lay these were succeeded by fives and drums 
and all the noise with which I had formerly heard the 4th of July ushered in, at the Navy Yard in Washington. Since I had left Maryland, I had carefully kept the reckoning of the days of the week, but had not been careful to note the dates of the months. Yet, as soon as the daylight appeared, and the door of our apartment was opened, I inquired and learned that this was, as I had supposed it to be, the day of universal rejoicing. I understood that the court didn't sit this day, but a great crowd of people gathered and remained around the jail all the morning many of whom were intoxicated and sang and shouted in honor of free government and the rights of man about eleven o'clock a long table was spread under a row of trees which grew in the street not far from the jail and which appeared to me to be the kind called in pennsylvania the pride of china at this table several hundred persons sat down to dinner soon after noon and continued to eat and drink and sing songs in honor of liberty for more than two hours at the end of the dinner a gentleman rose and stood up his chair near one end of the table and begged the company to hear him for a few minutes he informed them that he was a candidate for some office but what office it was i do not recollect and said that as it was an acknowledged principle of our free government that all men were born free and equal he presumed it would not be deemed an act of arrogance in him to call upon them for their votes at the coming election this first speaker was succeeded by another who addressed his audience in nearly the same language and after he had concluded the company broke up i heard a black man that belonged to the jailer or who was at least in his service say there had been a great meeting that morning in the courthouse at which several gentlemen had made speeches when i lived at the navy yard the officers sometimes permitted me to go up down with them on the fourth of july and listen to the fine speeches that were made there on such occasions about five o'clock the jailer came and stood at the front door of the jail and proclaimed in a very loud voice that a sale of most valuable slaves would immediately take place that he had sold many fine hands yesterday but they were only the refuse and the most worthless part of the whole lot that those who wish to get great bargains and prime property had better attend now as it was certain that such negroes had never been offered for sale in Colombia before. In a few minutes, the whole assembly that had composed a dinner party and hundreds of others were convened around the jail door, and the jailer again proceeded with his auction. Several of the stoutest men and the handsomest women in the whole company had been reserved for this day, and I perceived that the very best of us were kept back for the last. We went off at rather better places than had been obtained on the former day, and I perceived much eagerness amongst the bidders, many of whom were not sober. Within less than three hours, only three of us remained in the jail, and we were ordered to come and stand at the door, in front of the crier, who made a most extravagant eulogium upon our good qualities and capacity to perform labor. He said, these three fellows are as strong as horses and as patient as mules one of them can do as much work as two common men and they are perfectly honest mr m giffen says he was assured by the former masters that they were never known to steal or run away they must bring good prices gentlemen or they will not be sold their master is determined that if they don't bring six hundred dollars he will not sell them but will take them to Georgia next summer and sell them to some of the new settlers. These boys can do anything. This one, referring to me, can cut five cords of food in a day and put it up. He's a rough carpenter and a first-rate field hand. This one, laying his hand on the shoulder of one of my companions, is a blacksmith and can lay a plow share, put new steel upon an axe or mend broken chains. The other, he recommended as a good shoemaker, and well acquainted with the process of tanning leather. We were nearly of the same age, and very stout, healthy, robust young men, in full opposition of our corporal powers, and if we had been shut up in a room, with ten of the strongest of those who had assembled to purchase us, and our liberty had depended on tying them fast to each other, I have no doubt that we should have been free. If ropes had been provided for us 
after a few minutes of hesitancy amongst the purchasers and a closer examination of our persons that had been made in the jail yard an elderly gentleman said he would take the carpenter and the blacksmith and shoemaker were immediately taken by others at the required price it was now sundown the heat of the day had been very oppressive and i was glad to be released from the confined air of the jail and the hot atmosphere in which so many hundreds were breathing my new master asked me my name and ordered me to follow him we proceeded to a tavern where a great number of persons were assembled at a short distance from the jail my master entered the house and joined in the conversation of the party in which the utmost hilarity prevailed they were drinking toasts in honor of liberty and independence over glasses of toddy a liquor composed of a mixture of rum water sugar and nutmeg it was ten o'clock at night before my master and his companions had finished their toasts and toddy and all this time i had been standing before the door or sitting on a log of wood that lay in front of the house at one time i took a seat on a bench at the side of the house but was soon driven from this position by a gentleman in military clothes with a large gilt epaulette on each shoulder and a profusion of glittering bottles on his coat who passing near me in the dark and happening to cast his eye on me demanded of me in an imperious tone how i dared to sit on that seat i told him i was a stranger and didn't know that it was wrong to sit here he then ordered me with an oath to be gone from there and said if he caught me on that bench again he would cut my head off did you not see what people said upon the bench you saucy rascal said he i assured him i hadn't seen any white gentleman sit on the bench as it was near night when i came to the house that i had not intended to be saucy or misbehave myself and that i hoped he would not be angry with me as my master had left me at the door and hadn't told me where i was to sit i remained on the log until the termination of the festival in honor of liberty and equality when my master came to the door and observed in my hearing to some of his friends that they had celebrated the day in a handsome manner no person except the military gentleman had spoken to me since i came to the house in the evening with my master who seemed to have forgotten me for he remained at the door warmly engaged in conversation on various political subjects a full hour after he rose from the toast party at length however i heard him say i bought a negro this evening i wonder where he is rising immediately from the log on which i had been so long seated i presented myself before him and said here master he then ordered me to go to the kitchen of the inn and go to sleep but said nothing to me about supper i retired to the kitchen where i found a large number of servants who belonged to the house and among them two young girls who had been purchased by gentlemen who lived near augusta and who they told me intended to set out for his plantation the next morning and take them with him these girls had been sold out of our company on the first day and had been living in the tavern kitchen since that time they appeared quite contented and evinced no repugnance to setting out the next morning for their master's plantation they were of that order of people who never looked beyond the present day and so long as they had plenty of vegetables in this kitchen they didn't trouble themselves with reflections upon the cotton field one of the servants gave me some cold meat and a piece of wheat and bread which was the first i had tasted since i left maryland and indeed it was the last that i tasted until i reached maryland again i here met with a man who was born and brought up in the northern neck of virginia on the banks of the potomac and within a few miles of my native place we soon formed an acquaintance and sat up nearly all night he was the chief hostler in the stable of this tavern and told me that he had often thought of attempting to escape and return to virginia he said he had little doubt of being able to reach the potomac but having no knowledge of the country beyond that river he was afraid that he should not be able to make his way to philadelphia which he regarded as the only place in which he could be safe from the pursuit of his master. I was myself then young, and my knowledge of the country north of Baltimore was very vague and undefined. 
I, however, told him that I had heard that if a black man could reach any part of Pennsylvania, he would be beyond the reach of his pursuers. He said he could not justly complain of want of food, but the services required of him were so unreasonable, and the punishment frequently inflicted upon him so severe, that he was determined to set out for the north, as soon as the corn was so far ripe as to be fit to be roasted. He felt confident that by lying in the woods and unfrequented places all day, and travelling only by night, he could escape the vigilance of all and gain the northern neck, before the corn would be gathered from the fields. He had no fear of haunting food, as he could live well on roasting ears, as long as the corn was in the milk, and afterwards on parched corn, as long as the grain remained in the field. I advised him as well as I could, as to the best means of reaching the state of Pennsylvania, but was not able to give him any very definite instructions. This man possessed a very sound understanding, and having been five years in Carolina, was well acquainted with the country. He gave me such an account of the sufferings of the slaves on the cotton and indigo plantations, of whom I now regarded myself as one, that I was unable to sleep any this night. From the resolute manner in which he spoke of his intended elopement and the regularity with which he had connected the various combinations of the enterprise, I have no doubt that he undertook that which he intended to perform. Whether he was successful or not in the enterprise, I cannot say, as I never saw him nor heard of him after the next morning. This man certainly communicated to me the outlines of the plan, which I afterwards put in execution and by which I gain my liberty, at the expense of sufferings, which none can appreciate, except those who have borne all that the stoutest human constitution can bear, of cold and hunger, toil and pain. The conversation of this slave arose in my breast so many recollections of the past and fears of the future, that I did not lie down, but sat on an old chair until daylight, from the people of the kitchen, I again received some cold victuals for my breakfast, but I didn't see my master until about nine o'clock. The toddy of the last evening causing him to sleep late this morning. At length, a female slave gave me notice that my master wished to see me in the dining room, whether I repaired without a moment's delay. When I entered the room, he was sitting near the window, smoking a pipe with a very long handle, I believe more than two feet in length. He asked no questions, but addressed me with the title of Bowie, ordered me to go with the hostler of the inn, and get his horse and chaise ready. As soon as this order could be executed, I informed him that his chaise was at the door, and we immediately commenced our journey to the plantation of my master, which, he told me, lay at the distance of twenty miles from Columbia. He said I must keep up with him, and, as he drove at the rate of five or six miles an hour, I was obliged to run nearly half the time, but I was then young, and could easily travel fifty or sixty miles in a day. It was with great anxiety that I looked for the place, which was in future to be my home. But this didn't prevent me from making such observations upon the state of the country through which we travelled, as the rapidity of our marsh permitted. This whole region had originally been one vast wilderness of pine forests, except the low grounds and river bottoms, here called swamps, in which all the varieties of trees, shrubs, vines and plants peculiar to such places in southern latitudes vegetated in unrestrained luxuriance. Nor is pine the only timber that grows on the uplands, in this part of Carolina, although it is the predominant tree, and in some places prevails to the exclusion of every other. Oak, hickory, sassafras, and many others are found. Here, also, I first observed groves of the most beautiful of all the trees of the wood, the great southern magnolia, or green bay. No adequate conception can be formed of the appearance or the fragrance of this most magnificent tree by anyone who has not seen it, or scented the air when scented by the perfume of its flowers. It rises in a right line to the height of seventy or eighty feet, 
The stem is of a delicate taper form and casts off numerous branches in nearly right angles with itself, the extremities of which decline gently towards the ground and become shorter and shorter in the ascent, until at the apex of the tree they are scarcely a foot in length, whilst below they are many times found twenty feet long. The immense cones formed by these trees are as perfect as those diminutive forms which nature exhibits in the bar of the pine tree. The leaf of the magnolia is smooth, of an oblong taper form, about six inches in length and half as broad. Its color is the deepest and purest green. The foliage of the bay tree is as impervious as a break wall to the rays of the sun, and its refreshing coolness in the heat of a summer day affords one of the greatest luxuries of a cotton plantation. It blooms in May and bears great numbers of broad, expanded white flowers, the odor of which is exceedingly grateful and so abundant that I have no doubt that a group of these trees in full bloom may be smelled at a distance of fifteen or twenty miles. I've heard it asserted in the south that their scent has been perceived by persons fifty or sixty miles from them. This tree is one of nature's most splendid, and in the climate where she has placed it, one of her most agreeable productions. It is peculiar to the southern temperate latitudes, and cannot bear the rigors of a northern winter, though I have heard that groves of the bay are found on Fishing Creek in western Virginia, not far from Wheeling, and near the Ohio River. Could this tree be naturalized in Pennsylvania, it would form an ornament to her towns cities and country seats at once the most tasteful and the most delicious a forest of these trees in the month of may resembles a wood involved in an untimely fall of snow at midsummer glowing the rays of a morning sun we passed this day through cotton fields and pine woods alternately but the scene was sometimes enlivened by the appearance of lots of corn and sweet potatoes which i observed were generally planted near the houses i afterwards learned that this custom of planting the corn and potatoes near the house of the planter is generally all over carolina the object is to prevent the slaves from stealing and thus procuring more food than by the laws of the plantation they are entitled to in passing through a lane, I this day saw a field which appeared to me to contain about fifty acres in which people were at work with hoes amongst a sort of plants that I had never seen before. I asked my master what this was, and he told me it was indigo. I shall have occasion to say more of this plant hereafter. We at length arrived at the residence of my master, who descended from his chaise, and leaving me in charge of the horse at the gate, proceeded to the house across a long courtyard. In a few minutes, two young ladies and a young gentleman came out of the house and walked to the gate, near which I was with the horse. One of the ladies said they had come to look at me, and see what kind of a boy her pa had brought home with him. The other one said I was a very smart-looking boy and this compliment flattered me greatly they being the first kind words that had been addressed to me since i left maryland the young gentleman asked me if i could run fast and if i had ever picked cotton his manner didn't impress me so much in his favour as the address of his sister had done for her these three young persons were the son and daughters of my master after looking at me a short time my young master for so i must now call him ordered me to take the harness from the horse give him water at a well which was near and come into the kitchen where some boiled rice was given me for my dinner i was not required to go to work this first day of my abode in my new residence but after i had eaten my rice my young master told me i might dress myself or walk out and see the plantation but that i must be ready to go with the overseer the next morning End of chapter 5